Hi ladies. Today we are going to look at the passage in Luke 24 after Jesus has been crucified and after he rose from the dead. Um, there's a scene where there are two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. So we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Um, so let's jump right in. Luke 24, 13 to 32 says this. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. So let's pause here. It says that they were talking about everything that had happened. What had happened? Well, the chief priests and rulers had just delivered Jesus up to be condemned to death. Jesus was crucified, which even though Jesus had previously told his disciples that, that he would be put to death, they didn't fully understand what he meant. So this was shocking to his followers that he was crucified. What else that just happened was that his disciples were kind of freaking out. His followers hoped and believed that he was the one to redeem Israel. Many believed that Jesus would set the Jewish nation free from Roman oppression and bondage and usher in the kingdom of God. But when they saw Jesus crucified, their hopes were put to a test and they experienced a crisis of faith, especially now that it had been three whole days since he was killed. But what else that had happened was that some women followers of Jesus's amazed everyone by reporting that when they had gone to the tomb where Jesus lay to anoint his body for burial, not only did they not see Jesus in the tomb, but they actually saw a vision of angels who told them that Jesus was alive. Then what else was that some more of the disciples went to the tomb and they found it empty too. So our passage goes on in verse 15. As the two disciples on their way to Emmaus talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said that his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So where was Emmaus and why were these two disciples headed there? Emmaus was a small village, seven or eight miles northwest of Jerusalem or about a two hour walk from Jerusalem. These two people, one who is left unnamed and the other one named Cleopas, were likely headed there after having celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem. The two of them were disciples, 
not of Jesus' original 12 disciples, obviously, but Jesus had many disciples beyond the 12, including women. Which, an interesting side note that I read in my ESV study Bible, is that the Greek text here does not specify whether these two were men walking on the road to Emmaus, or if they were a man and a woman, perhaps a husband and a wife walking together. But so later we see in the story that these two disciples go and tell the remaining 11 disciples that they met Jesus. So we know that they were associated with those original 11. They knew them and they knew where to find them. And we'll understand later why that's important to our story. So these two disciples walking on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus were discouraged. But truly, they had no reason to be discouraged. They had heard the reports of the women that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was alive, but they did not fully believe it. Perhaps they regarded all that as idle tales. They were focused on their hope that Jesus would redeem Israel from Rome and begin ushering in the kingdom of God the way they had imagined it would be ushered in, with power and glory and force, not with a beaten and bloodied, crucified Messiah. And because things didn't go according to their own vision, to the way they had envisioned things happening, their hopes were shattered. They saw in their hearts the glory of the kingdom, but they failed to understand the role suffering would play. So as the two of them were walking along and talking together about the Lord Jesus, Jesus, unbeknownst to them, suddenly joins them. And here we see an illustration of the Lord's promise to us in Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20, where he says, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them. And just like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't realize they were in the company of Jesus, we often don't realize it either. Yet there he was, and likewise, here he is with us now. Amazing. So Jesus graciously walked with them and listened to what was likely a very animated and heated conversation until it gets to the point where Jesus asks them, what are you guys so upset about? What things just happened in Jerusalem? But isn't that a funny question? Jesus knew already what things had happened. He was there. These things had actually happened to him. I want you guys to see the glimpse this gives us into the Lord's heart that he wants to hear from us. He wants to hear our perspective, hear our thoughts, hear us retell a story. Yes, he already knows everything, but still, like we're told in Psalm 62, 8, we are to pour out our hearts to him. Yes, he was there when fill in the blank happened in our lives or in our day or in our week. And yes, he's fully aware of every detail that took place. He knows the details even better than we do. But still he tells us, come boldly into my throne room. And that word boldly has the connotation that says he wants us to come to him with freedom of speech. Why? If he already knows everything, why? Why does he want to hear it from you, in your words, from your perspective, with your facial expressions and your hand movements if you're a hand talker? Why? Don't you know? It's because he loves you. It's because he delights in you. You are his and he enjoys your company, your presence, you opening up to him. He loves you. So no doubt as these two guys or gal gal and guy, we don't know, we're not sure, as they walked along the road to Emmaus in their heated and animated conversation, they were quoting various Old Testament prophecies and trying to remember what Jesus had taught, but they were unable to put it all together and come up with an explanation that made sense to them. Was Jesus a failure or a success? Why did he have to die? Was there a future for the nation of Israel? Did they just get everything they had hoped in all wrong? The further they walked along the road to Emmaus, the more they made evident their unbelief. Why do I say that? Well, why were they going to Emmaus and not staying in Jerusalem where the other disciples and the apostles were? 
They had just heard that Jesus was risen, that the angels appeared. Why were they not going to stay with the other disciples? You might say, well, maybe they had some important business to tend to. But I would argue no. Because later, once they saw for themselves with their own two eyes the actual bodily risen Jesus, they dropped everything at once and went to Jerusalem to find and be with the other disciples. So why didn't they remain in Jerusalem with the other disciples when they heard the absolutely amazing, glorious, miraculous news that Jesus had risen? Why? It's because they didn't believe it. Why didn't they believe it? Because it conflicted with their preconceived notion. They, like the majority of Jews of, of the time, believed in their heart of hearts that their Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God in a certain way, with power and might and glory. And when he didn't do it the way they believed he should and would, they nearly gave up their hope in him. They stopped believing and they left. They wandered off someplace else. And so the question is, what are we expecting from God? What are you individually and what am I individually expecting from God? What do we believe he is going to do? And in what way do we believe in our heart of hearts that he is going to do it? Are we leaving any room in our hearts for him to move and work in a way that we're not expecting? And even in a way that seems contrary to how we think things should be done. Are we giving Jesus freedom to be who he is and do things the way he does them? The guys on the road to Emmaus saw Messiah as a conquering redeemer, not as a suffering servant. And that was all contrary to what they thought the Messiah should be. As they looked ahead and envisioned their Messiah, their breakthrough, the answer to their prayers, they foresaw the glory, but they didn't see the suffering that had to take place along the way. They anticipated the crown, but they never envisioned, they never imagined the cross. So when the suffering and when the cross came and became a reality, they didn't know how to fit that into their thinking and into their vision. And they thought maybe they had just gotten it all wrong. And they quit hoping. But praise the Lord, the strong Savior, the good shepherd, the one who loves us. Why? Because he walked up to the road they were walking on it. And he walked it with them. And don't you know, he comes up and walks along our roads with us too. Jesus approached these two disciples on their way from Jerusalem, on their way away from the other believers, on their way away from the place in which they belonged. And he came and rekindled a flame of belief that would cause their hearts to burn within them, the text says. That's what Jesus does, if we'll let him. And do you see the question Jesus poses to them? He says, you're so slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Jesus is referring to the fact that the entire Old Testament had shown how God brought his chosen leaders first through suffering and then to glory. Think of Joseph, Moses, Daniel, Paul, even Sarah and Esther, and so many more who faced great trials and suffering before receiving a reward of glory from the Lord. And if the pattern was set by these leaders in the scriptures, surely the pattern would be set and fulfilled by the Messiah. And surely we see the same pattern illustrated in our own lives. Suffering, yes, but right up alongside of that, a promise of glory. Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, of suffering through doing good. Let us not grow weary, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. 1 Peter 3, 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered a little while, he himself 
will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Suffering and then glory. So back to the text. The scripture here says that Jesus opened up the word of God to these two disciples as the three of them walked along the road to Emmaus. Jesus, the greatest teacher who ever lived, opened up the greatest book that was ever written and proceeded to explain from that book the greatest themes the human mind could ever fathom. And he didn't just explain doctrine or prophecy. It says that he explained the things concerning himself in all the scripture, in all the books, in all the prophets, in all the poetic writings of the Bible, in all of it. He revealed to them where he lived and moved and breathed on every page of scripture. He's there. Are we searching for him? He says, you will search for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Without Jesus, these two disciples on their way to Emmaus could have held their discussion for days and never arrived at a satisfactory answer because their real problem was not in their heads. It was in their hearts. They didn't need more proof. They needed more faith. They needed to know Jesus better. They needed to know not who they thought Jesus was or who they thought Jesus should be. They needed to know the great I am for who he truly is. The more we know the Lord, the better we know him, the greater faith in him we will have. Why do I say that? First of all, it's because he's good and perfect and he will not, could not, won't ever act in a way that is not perfectly loving towards us. As Jackie Hill Perry puts it in her book, Holier Than Thou, if God is holy, he can't sin. And if he can't sin, then he can't sin against you. So the more we know who God truly is, and the less we believe the lies and the misconceptions we have about him, the more we will trust him because he is good all the time, in every circumstance, always. Second of all, the more we know the Lord, the more faith we will have in him because simply it's like that with anyone we know and trust. For instance, my husband. I am married to a good man. He is the best father I know. I tell him all the time. I always tell him, I love my own dad, but I wish I, I could have had two dads and that he could have been one of them. I don't know exactly how all that would work out, but you get the point. He's awesome. I know his heart as a father. I know he loves his boys. I know this deeply about him, and I've learned this about him over time. So if he tells me that he's going to have a conversation with one of our sons about something serious, for instance, something weighty, something of consequence, I have faith that he's going to do everything in his power to have the best, most productive conversation with our son that he can have. I have faith in that because I know him. Or let's take, for example, Lucelle. I know Lucelle. She's my dear friend. I know her heart for the Lord and for prayer, for instance. If she tells me that she is earnestly praying for me, for me about something because I know how seriously she takes prayer, I have faith that she is going to pour out her heart to the Lord on my behalf. I have faith in my husband and his heart for our sons. I have faith in Lucille's passion for God and prayer. Why? Because I know them in this way. And it's the same with Jesus. The more we get to know him, the more we can put our faith in him and in his ways. The more we can take what the Bible says about him at face value, the more we can take him at his word and just believe it. The more we know him, the more we can say with power and sincerity, yes, Lord, when he says, trust me, daughter. So we cry out to the Lord, Lord, show me your ways. Reveal your thoughts to me. Let me know you better. Increase my faith in you. We seek him with all our hearts in his word, in spending time with him in prayer, in obeying him, in serving him, in talking about him with others, in hearing him preached and proclaimed, and yes, in walking through suffering with him 
by our side. So these two on the road to Emmaus, they needed to know God better. They needed more faith. Ladies, there's something special about faith. There's something about faith that means more to God than a lot of other stuff means to him. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says it's by faith that we are saved. It says that it's when we come to him without faith that we cannot please God. Out of everything, it was Abraham's faith that moved God in such a way that he credited that faith to Abraham as righteousness. It was the faith of the centurion that caused Jesus to marvel. It is through faith that we are justified and made at peace with God. More than that, it is by faith that God gives us the right to be called his children. There's something about faith that moves the heart of God. I believe in you, God. I trust you, God. I will obey you, God. I will seek you, God, and know you better and put my faith in you. Even when you don't move the way I thought you would. I trust you, Lord. I know you. You are good. Let's ask God to increase our faith and let's walk with him in obedience and see what he does in our lives and in our hearts. So our gracious Lord Jesus comes up alongside the two disciples on their way to Emmaus and shows them who Jesus truly is. And how does he show them? By opening up his word to them. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith in Christ comes by hearing the message of who Christ is. And that message is delivered to our hearts by the word of God. It's his message, his voice, his identity delivered to us by the vehicle of the scriptures. One of the biggest most concrete ways he wants to both author and increase your faith and mine is by revealing to us who he is through his word, the Bible. Are you giving him an opportunity to speak with precision to your heart through the word of God? Are you giving him time? Are you allowing him to speak to you through his word over the weeks, months, and years? Or like the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. It's been a few days of sticking around and nothing's really come of it, so you've kind of wandered off. Give the Lord more time. He wants to show you who he is his way. Give him the chance. So then, when our three travelers, Jesus and the other two, had made their way to the town of Emmaus and it was time for them to part ways, the two disciples asked Jesus to continue on with them to Emmaus, where they were headed. They didn't want to part ways with Jesus, even though they didn't even know who he was yet. They could recognize that there was something amazing and beautiful and luring about him that they did not want to leave them. They had been won over by the living word of God and they didn't even know who this stranger was. All they knew is that their hearts were burning within them, as they put it in verse 32, and they wanted the blessing to last. Merely possessing Bible knowledge can lead to a big head. 1 Corinthians 8 1 says that knowledge puffs us up, but receiving Bible truth and walking with the Savior will lead to a burning heart. We don't just want to search the Bible for knowledge. We want to search the Bible for Jesus. So back to the text, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus asked Jesus to come with him instead of parting ways and gracious Jesus, the one who loves us and doesn't rush past us, agrees to go and spend his evening with these two disciples. When they got to where they were going and they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread and broke it and blessed it. And it was then that miraculously the two disciples' eyes were opened and they recognized the man before them as the risen Lord Jesus. And then instantly he vanished from their sight. But keep in mind the fact that Jesus vanished did not mean that he abandoned them. Okay, as the omnipotent, omnipresent God, he was still with them, even though they could not see him. And in fact, they would see him again. 
So now these two disciples knew for themselves that Jesus was alive. They had the evidence of the open tomb, the angels, the witnesses, the scriptures, all the intellectual proof. And now they had their own personal experience with the Lord, the heart proof. So what happens next? It says the two of them immediately got up and within the hour left Emmaus and returned to Jerusalem to tell the believers that they had actually met Jesus and how he had explained everything to them on the road and how he was hidden until he broke the bread. But when they arrived, the apostles and the others told them that Jesus was alive and it appeared to Peter. Everybody was excited. Isn't that some of the best evidence that we have met the living Christ, that we have something exciting to share with others. When we're in the company of other believers, let's be like these disciples here who were excited and telling about everything that had happened. Let's be women who are eager to share with other believers everything that Jesus has made happen and is making happen in our lives and in our world. Let's use the precious time we have with another believer to talk about Jesus. Let's compare our mental notes with one another about what we've learned of him so we can grow in our knowledge of him. Let's use that time to encourage one another and stir up holy affections and love for our King who is so worthy. We have our treats and testimonies time coming up in just a couple weeks. Is there something exciting you have to share about Jesus? Was there a road or a path of pain or trouble you were walking along and suddenly, suddenly Jesus himself came and walked along beside you and did something that only Jesus could do? I encourage you to share it. Why? Because remember, faith is so precious to the heart of our Lord. And when you share how Jesus showed up for you, that's going to stir the faith of one of his other daughters listening who needs to hear about the Lord's goodness in that way, who needs to know Jesus better for herself. Testify. Ladies, thank you so much. And let's be sure to thank the Lord who comes along our road and rescues us out of our doubts and unbelief and confusions and misconceptions, who tenderly sees our hearts when we've given up and decided to head on home, who's faithful to come and spark a new flame of faith in our hearts. Praise him. Amen, ladies. Thank you.